The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to Paranormal Concept right here on Parasearch UK Radio with your host, Paul Brook. A good evening and welcome to the Paranormal Concept Show. Now, I know you're expecting to hear the lovely dulcet tones of our Paul Rook, but unfortunately, Paul's having a week off this week, um, so isn't going to be able to do the show. But I've taken the helm tonight because I've managed to get two amazing guests into the studio. Well, I say guests, we have one guest and one co-host. I've got a guest co-host this week who you all know and love very well. His name is Gary Bradfield. Good evening, Gary. How are you? Good evening, Kerry. I'm fine, and how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Now, you've brought a very, very interesting topic to the table and a fantastic guest to help us discuss this one, haven't you? Well, I hopefully I hate, or put my teeth back, hopefully I have, yes. Um, it's the, obviously the Rendlesham Forest incident. We all know what happened or we all think we know what happened. So mm-hmm. I, I basically contacted you and asked you if you would like to have a certain Mr. David Young on board for a show. And you gladly turned around and said, yes, you would. So there you go. It's over to you. Well, it is a fantastically, um, oh, God, controversial topic, the Rendlesham Forest incident. So before we get into it, let's welcome our guest on. Good evening, David. How are you? Good evening, Kerry and Gary. Thank you, David. I'm pleased to be here and uh, thank you for the invite. Oh, no, thank you so much for coming on, particularly as England are playing tonight as well. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how well they're doing. I I understand it's a draw at the moment and it's going into extra time or something, is it? I don't know. (laughs) Oh, they're going to have to claw it back by the skin of their teeth then, aren't they? (laughs) Same same old story. Same old story, but we we sometimes sometimes manage it. Um, Now, the Rendlesham Forest um, event has been banded as the very British Roswell um, incident in regards to the ufology world. Now, if you don't know what Rendlesham Forest is about... The story um, started back in the 1980s, in the December 1980s. Um, and basically, it, it's a basically about a group of American airmen who were confronted by an alien spaceship in Rendlesham Forest. Um, now, there is so much to this story that we're going to hopefully break it down and find out, hopefully, what actually did happen. Because there's so many false starts and there's so many... Um, I don't want to... Say, Get lies about it, <laughs> should we put it that way? Um, there's so many different things. I mean, very first hit the newspapers um, in the news of the world. Now, apparently it was by an informant um, by the pseudonym of Art Wallace who said that his life would be threatened if he talked about it, which is why he used a pseudonym. Now, this guy, Art Wallace, is actually known as a, uh, is actually by a guy called Larry Warren, Um, who is well known in the ufology world. And most of the accounts people know about Rendlesham is actually the account he put out in a book. Isn't that right, David? That's correct, yeah. Left at Eastgate. Left at Eastgate. Now, I've been to Rendlesham. Have you been to Rendlesham, um, Gary? Not yet. Believe it or not, I'm literally on the doorstep of Rendlesham Forest, and I've never been there. (laughs) Well, that's going to have to change, I feel. It is changing, actually changing this year. We're actually, I'm actually going there this year, so I'm doing a, an event there with David Young, actually, as a guest ufologist. Um, and we're doing a uh, UFO, UFO watch and uh, ghost hunt experience this year. So, 
Fantastic. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Brenda Bartley will be joining us. I hope she, she was anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's absolutely. I have to say, having been there myself, it is an intriguing place to walk the route of what where these events were supposed to have happened. Um, It's well laid. It's well laid out. There's a ufology walk, a UFO walk that you can do um, through the forest. You know, all set out by the Forestry Commission. So, you know, it's well noted. You can find the gate. You can find the road down. You can go across the road to the bit where they've got a lovely statue now of a alien aircraft and everything so it's actually quite a fascinating little place now first of all this didn't just happen in one incident did it this happened over from what i know three nights Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's 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 the first point of controversy (laughs) that's that's kind of debatable but well i suppose we we should assume that it was over three nights that that's kind of the the main story that we get from several instances, yeah. Okay, do you want to give it's, us a basic overview of what happened on um, through the occasion? Uh, yeah, I can try and do that for you. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on basically, there was there were lights being seen on the Christmas Day, nineteen eighty, uh, on the twenty fifth, into the night of the twenty sixth, uh, the early hours of the twenty sixth. Uh, John Burroughs and uh, is it, uh, it was with somebody else. Anyway. Well, I can't think what his name was. Uh, on, on, and they and they reported it in, and they were asked for permission to go and see it. And Jim Peniston came from the Woodbridge base uh, to join them, and they went out into the woods, the three of them. Uh, and they basically they they saw they they saw a landed craft apparently. And even Jim Peniston said he, he touched it and he took notes and everything. Uh, there was a, there, there's some reported missing time of about 45 minutes, I understand. Uh, that apparently John Burroughs was knocked out by some sort of a beam or something. So, so, the, so some stories go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that kind of has, has changed a little bit uh, from, from different... Uh, uh, that, that does seem to n- not be a solid story. It, it sort of changes a little bit because you know John Burroughs actually claimed for a, a, just for an injury for the Air Force and eventually got it sort of just a few years ago. Mm-hmm. I think I think it was around about 2015, 16, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So, so it so seems the Air, the Air Force did admit to something happening, but obviously what that thing was is. Uh, it's not really obviously being made public, but they have admitted that something happened. So, so that happened on the first day. That was the first occasion, was it, where they thought the aircraft had landed, they went up and touched it, and that was the first incident. Yeah. Now the confusion comes in. With, with Colonel Holt's date on his on his memorandum, uh, he put down um, dates that were probably not right. <laughs> And this is where you get confusion as to what actually happened on what date. Um, okay. And it, seems, and it seems like the Larry Warren version in Left at Eastgate goes along with those incorrect dates on um, the Holt Memorandum. Okay. Uh, I, be- I read somewhere that it was two weeks later that that was written. It was, yeah, it wasn't. In fact, I think it was longer than that. But it was certainly, yeah, it wasn't short straight after. There were a report. There was a report on the blotters that uh, Barrows and Peniston made, and, um, and, they, and I think Holt was told about it in the morning when he arrived, and uh, and they were, you know, basically they was making fun of it, and um, I think several people just sort of uh, tried to sort of brush it off, and, uh, and I think the next incident incident was when Holt was at a a party or it's like a Christmas party type of thing. Yeah, that was unboxing day, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And someone I think it was um was it? Oh Bruce England was is the name of it. It's Holt. He came in and said said to Holt, it's back and Holt said, What's back? Now that would be the second night then, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Can I just play a, devil's advocate here? Because if this is a twenty seventh and Holt went out on the on that night when he said it's it's back. 
that's kind of um, <laughs> that doesn't go along with some of the other stories that it was a couple of days later on the twenty eighth, twenty ninth. This is where the confusion falls in a, a lot, I think. Um, mm. And because Holt's dates on the memorandum are incorrect, it's kind of thrown a lot of it uh, 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 up the wall, really. <laughs> Gary? Well, I was just saying, could I actually play devil's advocate here? I mean, I'm not, um, not going to throw reports out, obviously. But we, we're saying that this actually <coughs> presumably happened on the 26th and 28th of December. 1980. Mm-hmm. Now, David's just said, obviously, Colonel Holt was at a Christmas party. Yep. yep. And now, would it be that uh, the memories of so-called pers- military personnel have been st- distorted over the course of them having a drink at this party? Yeah. Um, I suppose it's a factor that you could throw into it, but the fact of the matter is, Besides that, is there was light, there were lights uh, reported from the ride, on radar <laughs> before that though. Mm. See, on the twenty sixth, uh, sorry, the twenty fifth during the day. Okay, and, well um, let, let's so, go before we get into those those side of things. Okay, um, the the timing of this, I feel, it is quite integral because of the dates. If it happened yeah. on, as Gary said, on Christmas Day and Boxing Day, over that period of time. We, uh, bearing in mind, in the 1980s, there was no major political um, standing up, as it were, for the military at that time. The, the, well, actually, no, no, actually, you're wrong. It was actually the height of the Cold War at that time. There was lots of things going on with uh, Poland and, uh, and Afghanistan. You know, I think the Russians have invaded Afghanistan. So it was actually quite a hot period in the uh, okay. Cold, Cold War period. It'd be interesting um, to know what um, our coding was at that time. Because, you know, we have like a, oh, like when we went yeah, through I, the night, around 9-11, we went up to a red alert, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. So it would be interesting to know what alert we were actually on at that particular time. Yeah. Well, I mean, considering they were having a Christmas party, I don't think they were on much of an alert. <laughs> exactly. That's what we're saying. I mean, you know, it's Christmas, everyone's relaxing, there's a lot of drinking probably going on, God knows what else for the military, you know, the lower level military, that is. Um it kind of does make you wonder if if their perception is not necessarily perfect. Yeah, no, I, I disagree because I mean, whatever. I mean, you've got people always off duty in in, in whatever air force or army. Or whatever, there's always people off duty, but there's always people on duty, and those people would be doing their job. I mean, it was oh, it's there were there were nuclear missiles based there so uh. they're not going to be sort of uh, it's quite a sensitive <laughs> sensitive thing isn't it you know okay at the heart of the cold war now, i don't think they're all going to get sort of drunk or, or drugged up and uh, just ignore that fact okay that's a fair point no, 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 that's a fair point no, it's fair i mean i'll just sort of throw it in a, a question that somebody could possibly answer you know and i'm not trying to play devil's advocate on our yes, military carry on now you <laughs> on, on our military personnel and the American military personnel it's no just, it's just it, questions it, that people are going to ask isn't it uh, of yeah. course I do yeah you know th- these are like natural questions and uh, any of the squaddies that I've met have been quite drunk quite a lot of the time yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact in fact I have heard lately there, there was some sort of a drug bust going on sort of around about that time as well with, you know I don't know who was involved in that but uh, but I don't think it was connected to the actual um, UFO landing. I think it was just something that was going on. And I do believe that after the UFO landings, a lot of them were going out into the woods in their, in their um, own time and uh, having parties out in the woods waiting for the UFOs to come back again. <laughs> so in as, the first... As you, as you do. <laughs> as you do. Yeah. Well, of course you would, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. So on the first incident, the first night, it was just mm. three servicemen that went out into the woods and said they encountered... A landed UFO in the woods. That's right. There's the, and apparently, uh, Jim Peniston actually touched the um, vehicle, for want of a better word. Uh, he saw um, strange hieroglyphics on, on the side of it. Mm-hmm. So, so he says, and made notes of it in his notebook. Um, in the back of his notebook, he put some. Um, 
there's a, there's there's something coming out now that he, he, there was um, binary code being downloaded. Yes. But at the time, that wasn't mentioned. Mm. Now, this is a little bit of a controversial area going on now, because why was that kept quiet until kind of in these later years? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I I don't know. I haven't really got a quick, an answer to that until okay. I really hear what what um, Jim Peniston's um, story is. And, and, and I, I do. I mean, I don't disregard his story at all. Same as John Burroughs. I think I I, had, I actually support all of them because they they all went through something. You know, and I know there's a lot of animosity between all of them now. They, you know, they sort of don't get on and don't agree with each other. But um, I've got the same admiration for all of them because they all went through something that none of us probably will ever ex- experience, you know. Well, yeah, this is the, the thing, isn't it? Something happened that night, mm. um, whatever it was. Now, what did the spacecraft allegedly look like? It was kind of like what a lot of people call it the a lemon squeezer, giant lemon squeezer, because <laughs> it, that's kind of what it, the way it looks like on the in the model that you see in the woods. Yeah. And some people, there's been descriptions that it changed, it changed shape a little bit, that it went sort of uh, luminous and uh, see through and had mist around it and coloured lights and. Um, I think there's differing reports as to what it looked like. And this is the whole problem with, with most of the witnesses, that the, they, they all seem to be reporting slightly different things, not exactly the same thing. You know, it's, uh, this is where a lot, a lot more of the confusion comes in. But at the same time, it doesn't... You, you, you hear about the lighthouse theory. I mean, if they, if they saw a physical object, it certainly wasn't a, a lighthouse, was it? You know? No, that's true. But and let's was... face it, let's, let's face it, they were actually professional airmen. They were either lying, or to both together, and Jim Penniston and John Burroughs didn't know each other. Well, not, not, not that I know, I didn't know each other at the time. So why would they back each other's lie up? Um, you know, it's, it, it, you've got to sort of take all that into consideration. Now, the, the next night, when they were chasing the lights across the sky with, with Holt, mm. I think at some point, when they were crossing that field... They were chasing the lights, but there was also a pulsating light from the lighthouse because I think they, they went a certain distance and they could see, oh, well, that's, that's the lighthouse pulsation. But they were not the same lights that they were also following. They, they kind of blended together. And this is kind of where I think that lighthouse theory came from one or two people that, uh, oh, that's the answer to everything. It's just a lighthouse. But, I mean, these airmen were quite used to seeing that lighthouse. They knew it was there. Um, and also, if that was, if it was the lighthouse, why didn't they report it all these other years? And 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 after that as well, they would have seen it, you know, not just that two or three nights. I have to say, when we was it when we went to Rendlesham, um, that was one of the theories that we actually looked for because you know we mm. was looking for that particular thing because we was going, could it be in the lighthouse? <laughs> and I have to say, although it has been the woods have been thinned a little bit now compared to what yeah, it was back in the 1980s. It's not a huge difference, is it? I, I, as I understand it, I haven't been there for a few weeks now, but Brenda said it had been quite hacked quite badly. Uh, certain places, like um, you know, some of the pathways have gone completely. Uh, and, and, and for a little while, I don't know what it's like now, but it was, apparently it was quite dangerous where they closed it all off and uh, where the little felled, felled trees and everything. So right. I can't really answer that. I think it's changed quite a bit from when it, what, what it was back what then. What it was then. back in the day. But effectively, if it's mm. thinner, the lighthouse would be more clearer to see. Well, yeah, but it's not really working now, is it? I'm not sure if it's a well, working it was on the night. Now. Well, it was the night I went because we was looking for that because the, the guy I was oh, with... Uh, on the yeah. night, that's one of the theories we were actually looking for. And although it, you have to be conje- uh, you have to have a, a sceptical mind because we haven't got the same mm. meteorological conditions on the night. There was a lot of cloud cover. You know what I mean? That sort yeah. of thing. You can't recreate it exactly. You kind of would say, "Oh yeah, that's quite." I can understand why they would think that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because the way it pulsed, they haven't they worked it out that it was the same pulse in between that fitted yeah. the lighthouse. Well, this is why I say they were sort of probably, at, at one point, when they were going across the field, they were probably seeing the both. 
they were seeing the lights in the sky changing because they were they, I mean they were going and it shot a, a, a beam down apparently as well so I mean the lighthouse wouldn't do that but I think they got to a certain point and they were actually seeing the lighthouse beam as well as the, the UFOs there was the a UFO. lot but there was an awful lot of stuff going on around that time um, in the skies wasn't there there was very clear sky conditions yep from what I understand from now, what I understand, too, yeah. Yeah, from what I say, I'm not, a, a, I'm not an authority on this, guys. This is just from my basic research that I've done. I do believe that um, the British Astronomical Association said that there was an exceptionally bright meteor that had been seen over that area, and there was ball yeah. lightning as well in the atmosphere at that time. Oh, that's the old excuse, ball lightning, yeah. And um, these are just things I found out. Um, it's yeah. like you say, it's full of, um, you know, like rabbit holes, this particular story, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But it still doesn't explain the, the craft on the ground, does it? No, but then again, we have heard another theory where there was testing being done for the space shuttle, and that's actually what came down. And that would kind of explain the shape as well when you think of the space shuttle. You're if talking it was a about prototype? That, that, that capsule, just the capsule with the... Um, yeah, I, I really don't go along with that story either because uh, I've heard about the, uh, the... That was actually a different time, I believe. That that was already on base. Wow. I say, uh, these, these I, are just theories and I, ideas that have been put out there for an explanation, an explanation yeah. as to what could have occurred on that night. Now... That first instance, you talked about um, Burroughs, who touched the yeah. meteor. Uh, sorry, well, not didn't... meteor, the, the, the spaceship. <laughs> that's a completely different story. Yeah, yeah that's a completely different story. Um, no, he touched the spaceship. Now, No, it was Jim Peniston, actually. Sorry. Um, and he, like you said, was supposed to have had a load of information downloaded into his brain, wasn't he? So, does, yeah, that's so right. the yeah. So the story so, says. So, so, so he reported, yeah. But he didn't report that at the time. He, he, I think he kept that to himself. Um, you, you know, and it's sort of just materialising over the last couple of years now. And um, they, they, they've been working on a book together, him and... Um, I can't think of his name at the moment. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, there is a book coming out, hopefully, um, pretty, soon, pretty soon now. I think it's nearing completion. Um, so do we know what sort of things were supposed to have been downloaded? Well, I will say that Brenda told me that she's been getting binary... If you read Sky Crash, she's been getting binary downloads for, for years. Um, but she doesn't really know what they mean. Now she gets a, a, um, a coded... Because Brenda's quite psychic herself. And mm. I don't know if you, you, do you know Brenda at all, if you've spoken to her? No, I haven't been lucky enough to do so. No. Uh, well, maybe one day you want to get her on. Yeah, maybe um, we will. But, uh, well, she can tell you about her binary herself, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, she's been getting that for years. Um, so, if... I mean, I can only assume that Jim Peniston, if he's got the same thing coming down to him, or being devil's advocate, like, like Gary said, has he copied that story from Brenda? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to accuse anybody of anything. No, know, but, no. It's just talking we, around and, the topic, and, isn't until, it? Until we hear the full story and, and, you know, how it came about, I think we can't really judge it, you know. So were they injured at all by, by being um, near this craft? Were they, were they, did they get any kind of burns or...? or... No, well, well uh, I think um, John Burroughs had some sort of eye damage to it and that's how he got his, um, disability, got his uh, Air Force disability um, paid off. I don't think it was, well, I think it was disability. I mean, it did affect him in some way, and he got injured. I'm not sure what the injuries were, but I think it did affect his eyes. And uh, Jim Peniston, I think, was affected in a different way. I think it kind of um, scarred him um, mentally, and mm. I think it meant. I think it scarred all of them mentally, to be honest. Um, well, I don't know the full ins and outs. I don't think Jim was actually physically damaged but John was mm. but I don't so, know if any but I don't think anyone else was apart from being uh, like mentally damaged which to be fair you come across that kind of thing in the woods in the middle of the night when you're on duty yes. um, it, it's going to freak you out let's let's be fair if we, if we take it on face value yeah. Mm. yeah 
But um, uh, there's, there's been reports of aliens being sight, seen a few, if you copy, see by one story. I mean, apparently there was no aliens being seen on, on that night. Um, right. Gary? Well, I've just, um, we saw sort of like going on about the UFO, it's landed, um, you know, the Americans have seen what they've seen, they wrote it down. Now, we haven't really touched base on where it's actually supposed to have landed. Now, it's supposed to have landed in the vicinity of RAF Brentwater and RAF Woodbridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Brentwater had nuclear weapons. Right? Now, th- if you go by the crow, flow by the crow, I think you'll find about 20 miles north is Sizewell B which is also a nuclear power plant. Yeah. Now, I did, if you take those three factors in, the, the two RAF bases plus Sizewell, is that a major factor that they've come down just to see how far our technology has gone? Well, I think I, I really do think that our nuclear capabilities that are of great interest to um, whatever visitors we're getting. Now... There's, there's a lot of debate as to whether they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional. I think the interdimensional is a quite a strong argument of some sort, you know, um, because if they're living in the same environment we are, they would be more interested in the environment, because if we destroy our planet, it's going to destroy their environment as well, or certainly have an impact on it. Yeah. That's you know, true. That's... So... Going back to the first in, the first night, the first instance, these three guys have this experience. I assume they then hightail it back to their base. Yeah. And I think they, uh, it. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they followed it for a while and it disappeared and um, they, they sort of just ended up going back to the base, which is the early hours of the morning. They would made they, a report. Would they have had any form of communication with the base whilst they were out investigating this situation yeah i think one of them was left actually um within communication um yeah by radio uh, but i think they were actually losing the signal in the woods um i think we know that the, the, i don't you haven't been there gary have you? but uh, no. we do know that quite a lot of the time we even with mobile phones there are certain points where you, you don't get a good mobile phone signal but that's not quite the same thing as what they were experiencing but they would have been military um, communication mm-hmm. units. But they were losing communications as well. So, you know. On, on uh, the first night, yeah. So there's yeah. no transcript on the first night of what was being communicated through, is there? Yeah. Um, I don't think there is, no. I think the only transcript you've got is of um, Holtz. It's the second tape. one, isn't it? Yeah. Well, is it second or third? That's still uh. one to the debate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the way, the way I see it, I mean, if it was reported the night before, it looks like they were having the party on the 27th, like Boxing Day. Mm-hmm. Was it the 28th? I don't, I don't, it's a bit sort of debatable there. Um, the way I, I've, I've seen it written down, it kind of looks like it was the night after. And they're saying it's back, which would have been the Boxing Day, the 27th. And now that would be the day. See, I mean, if, if Holt went out, Bustinza went with Holt, and then Warren saying he was with Bustinza, so that would make it the second night. So yeah, that's kind of where it all gets a bit sort of hairy. And it, the, trouble yeah. is, the trouble is, with Holt's memorandum, the dates are wrong. And, and if you read left at Eastgate, Warren's saying the 29th that he saw his UFO, which was the date, where, which is incorrect on Holt's mem- memorandum. Mm. So. Okay, so that ha- they go back to the base, they've reported it, um, and they've probably gone to the medical bay and been checked over and mm. debriefed or whatever happened from that point on, which we don't really know, do we? No, I think they just reported to the office in the morning. They, they made their report out to, to Holt, and I think it was treated as a joke. And mm. they, were, they, they had the mickey take about it. And, and then I think Holt, um, I think he reported it to the, the space commander. Um, uh, more than, and, um, and then obviously the next thing happened with the party when the, mm. when they then Holt was Holt didn't believe it himself. He said, "Oh, let's go and sort this out and find out what's really going on." You know, basically, and he, and he got his little tape recorder. And, 
his little tape recorder. Yeah, it's one of those little uh, dictaphone things, you know, and I yeah, think yeah. he picks up an extra tape and everything for it, and um, off they went. And apparently the, the recording was quite a lot longer than was actually re- released. I think that was like an edited version of it. Um, but there you go. I mean, it's really sort of not known really for sure what, what happened, you know. Well, they've gone out into the woods, and he's actually gone this time. Now, I can imagine, after the first incident, particularly the timing of the year and, and high jolly spirits in the base yeah. and all this, you can imagine they've gone back. Everyone's probably taking the mickey, even though mm. these guys are probably a bit traumatised and then giving it the big I am, going, oh, no, 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 you know, it was, it happened and all this. So you can imagine yeah. kind of setting the scene a little bit here. Um, and then... Or it's a, it's a big joke or a big hoax. Mm. You can imagine that that's how the first incident was taken because it doesn't seem to have been taken particularly seriously. Considering, no. considering when you think that, like Gary has said about the location and the integral parts of the military and nuclear bases and stuff like that, you would think the reaction that there's something that's landed in that forest, you would think that would have been taken a lot more seriously. Yeah, I, I I think they they originally thought when they saw the lights in the in the forest, they thought it was a crash plane of some sort, or some light, or like maybe a light aircraft had come down or something, and that's why they went out to investigate it. And this is when they saw this uh, light moving through the forest and and then settled down. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they've gone out to check, and then they have this experience, and then they come back say, "We've just seen an alien spacecraft," and they're all like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, right." What did you really yeah. see? No, no, we really saw an alien aircraft. Yep, yep, jokes, jokes. I don't, the know same... actually, I, don't, I don't know if they actually came back and said they saw an alien. I think they, they came back and said they, they'd seen a craft of some sort. So they may not have actually thought of it as being alien at the time. They might have thought it was a, a foreign craft of some sort, you know. I still wonder the unreaction of the airbase in general, though. You would think there would be like a major scramble to check the woods more on that on the night the first incident night you I, yeah. would, I really would have thought that if that was something like you say particularly because you've got two air force bases and a nuclear power station right near it you would think that something unknown that close because it, it's walking distance everybody we're not talking like east gate to yeah. the, the site is walking distance it's not that far you would think that the reaction from the air force base on the first incident from what those three men saw that night, there would have been a bigger reaction from the Air Force Base. Yeah, I, I, I will say here, remember, that it was on British territory. The base was off of, well, it was not British territory. So the, the, the airmen from the base were Americans on British territory. They got permission from, you know, and that's a disarm, apparently. Well, I understand that one or two of them didn't. But okay. uh, they, went out to, they went out to the base. There was, a, it, it should have actually been a, a police report. Really? Okay, and so that's yeah, my next okay. question then. Did they report it to a British authority yeah, to come there was down a police, and look? Yeah, there was a police report made, yeah. And, yes. Uh, but I don't, I, you know, <laughs> I don't like to say it, but sometimes their police re- reports are, are a bit lax and they don't sort of go and see it for a couple of days. Uh, I've got a feeling that's what happened here. I think right. they made uh, a report, but they didn't actually go and see the, the base, the, you know, the, the actual place until a couple of days later. Um, that's, that's, that's how I understand it. I'm going to butt in here yep. and just say that the Suffolk police were actually called on the first night of the initial sighting. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. they and then they actually went back the following morning, and by all accounts, in their words, they found nothing unusual. That's right. But I, what, I, what I was saying is that when I said that, see, the, the thing is, they some people said that they, they were speaking to, with American air, airmen. But mm. they saw no no American airmen out there, uh, and apparently they they found um, rabbit scratchings or something where this thing is supposed to have landed, and that was kind of the report. But I, I think if you read the you can't sell the people by Johnny Brunei, there's a they actually went out maybe a couple of days after that report. There's not an actual definite there's not an actual definite report that they visited that day, the second day after. You know? It's very sketchy, it's isn't it? Considering yeah. this is quite a major, um, unusual occurrence that's happened. That yeah, there was a report made, but was there really a visit the day after, or was it a couple of days after? You know, yeah. that, that's where it's a bit. Um, 
it's all sketchy. The, considering we are talking police forces and military, and the way that those things have to be logged, it is all very sketchy. I, I can't get my head around how sketchy <laughs> all the details yeah. of this case are. Yeah. Well, there were a couple of uh, civilian um, um, witnesses as well made mm. reports out as well, so, which is kind of where the, the police came into it as well. They reported it to police. So, um, you know, there, there was a, oh, there was people coming home from like um, Christmas Christmas Day and, and stuff on their way home and saw these, these lights going through the woods. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I will uh, say this: when you when we say UFO, um, we kind of automatically, as as normal people, we think we know it's an identified flying object, but we think the alien factor. That's kind of like the normal people, but for a military, it's just an unidentified flying object. They wouldn't necessarily be jumping to the conclusion of aliens, would they? Um, it depends on how you look at the military. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I actually, I actually think they know a lot more about what's going on than they admit to. Wow. That's my opinion, and not my own, not only my opinion, but quite a lot of um, people that sort of read a lot about this sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, well, you're more of an authority on that than I am because I'm not a yeah. ufology girl at all. So on the second night, let's talk about the second night now, the second night instance where where um, uh, Colonel Holt was at the dinner, um, which was at RAF Woodbridge, and then Lieutenant Bruce England came and said, the UFO is back. And then they went out into the woods, didn't they? He went back to the base, Woodbridge, and no, sorry, Brentwater, and then went out into the woods with some men. And imagine he must be pretty, feeling pretty peed off because he'd have had to go and get he had to go and get his uh, fatigues on and everything, and yeah. go traipsing out into a cold on a cold night mm-hmm. after being in the, a nice warm um, party atmosphere with cigar know, and have, brandy. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. He must have been pretty peed off as as, as some of them because it was quite a cold night apparently. Do you think it was at thing. that point? Um, Colonel Holt suddenly thought, actually, this, there's more to this than just the th- what the three lads said last night. Do you oh, think I'm it was at that point it yeah. started? Yeah, I, that's at the actually, point he started to take it seriously. Yeah, he actually went out thinking, that, oh, I'm going to sort this out, and it's, it's a ridiculous story, you know. And then, of course, they they were seeing the, the, the lights in the sky flying across, and they were going, they, they went through the woods and. Uh, um, and you can, well, you can hear it on the tape if you listen to it. That they're describing the, it's describing the lights, uh, and he's talking to other several other um, airmen. Um, you know, they're describing it, and you, you can actually hear them. You know, the way they're following the light, and mm-hmm. they, they get to a point, and apparently uh, they, they cross this field, and this is when I believe the, the light came into the picture because they then saw. The lights pulsating also, as well as the, the, the UFO lights. Well, I'm calling them UFO lights because that's, that's kind of the way it's been described. Yeah. But, um, but there was no reported landing with the whole term. Well, to, to, my, to my understanding, it wasn't. No, I, I, I'm with the same understanding. I think the landing was supposed to be there, the there first was, night, wasn't was it? A, there was a laser beam apparently fired down close to where the whole says close to where he was standing. Uh, like a pencil beam of light, and the, the, it went off. And eventually, they were following these lights, and they just all sort of disappeared, basically. Mm. So he's gone out into the woods, followed these lights, and what do you think then he was thinking at that time? I know I'm asking you to be um, conjecture <laughs> on this point, but as a officer. I mean, he's a high-ranking officer. He's a lieutenant. Mm, mm, you know, mm. he's a lieutenant colonel. He's not just a military guy, is he? He's a lieutenant yeah, colonel. No. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. I, I, um, I think at the time, he must have been thinking, I've got to make a report about this, and it's going to be embarrassing. That's probably what was... And, and I think they were... Um, resisting making a report but they they ended up having to make a report out about it and that's just why it was a couple of weeks later mm-hmm. you know and, um, i think they probably would i think he would have liked not to have got involved in it and sort of just let it go but um because um things went the way they did they just had to make a report out about it for, for the uh for the british government okay so 
well, yeah. As an American <coughs> going, oh my God, we're going to look well stupid in the eyes of the yeah. British. <laughs> yeah. Um, but well, that's so, what was released eventually through the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah. Now, after that, they followed the lights and everything else. They went out and they actually took some equipment out, didn't they? Didn't they take yeah, what, Geiger what, counters and stuff like that out? Yeah, Geiger counters and light oils and things. And apparently they were they were um, not functioning well. And uh, I think the, the, maybe one or two vehicles are supposed to have been full up with fuel and they, they were breaking down, etc. Um, there's there's a lot of controversy about how many actually uh, everyone actually went out on the, on that second or third night, whichever we, we, we're going to go with. Because mm. there's, like you say, there's the controversy of about whether it was the second or third night. Um, some people say there was 20, some people say there was 30, some people say there were 50, and if you, like what Larry Warren said, like 200 or something, couldn't he? Oh, my God. Uh, or 100. <laughs> you know, there, it, you know, it, there, was, there was such a vast amount of difference for people. But um, I think Holt eventually went with about 30 people eventually. Um, I think that was roughly around about the amount of people that were around. Somebody, somebody can correct me if anyone listening. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but it certainly wasn't like a vast amount of people out there. And, um, and I think they sort of all divided up into little groups, basically. To, and so they are taking but, it more seriously at this point that something's yeah. going on in the woods and yeah. they need to get to the bottom of it, basically. You've got yeah. a lieutenant colonel going, we are going to find out what's going on out here. And um, it, you can imagine how eerie it must have been, though. You've got equipment going wrong. They're military guys. They've got this wacky story from the night before that's gone on with these three guys. Um, you've got, you know, lights that they can't explain. And we are talking military people, so they're not prone to... You would think that they are no, they would know about meteorological conditions. You would think they mm. would know all those kind of explanations. Yeah, and they would have known about the lighthouse. <laughs> and you, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's quite a big part of the landscape there, isn't it? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine that people are getting a little unnerved at this point. Then they come across in the woods markings, don't they? Yeah, there was a de- depressions in the triangular shape. but um, mm-hmm. and, and I understand Jim Penniston went back the next day and took some uh, plaster casts of these, mar- of these um, indentations. Uh, as I understand it, uh, I think Holt ended up with one or two. I think um, I think somebody else took, took some um, plaster casts as well, and then one of them they, they went missing or something. He tried to send them back home. Or was it Peniston? I'm not sure. But I think Peniston though, had one went missing. And um, that's all quite strange. As who would want to pinch that? Or where, where did it go? Or did it go in lost luggage? Mm-hmm. And there was markings on the trees as well. Now, that has been passed off as General Wood Forestry Commission kind of workings, hasn't it? That's sort of been, I'm Um, going to use air quotes, explained as um, just carvers, like wood chopper people. (laughs) Technical term there, everybody. (laughs) I mean, I suppose it depends... It, it really depends as to which story you want to go with. I mean, some people, uh, some say it was actually caused by the UFO. Some people say I wasn't there, so I don't, I can't make a judgment on that. No. Um, it, you can only go by the different reports. I've heard the reports about the wood carvings, and I've heard the reports about the it was the UFO that did it. So, which way do you go? I don't know. No, uh, that again, that's one of those unknowns, isn't it? It's unknown equations on that one. However. I mean, I'm going to play devil's advocate now, Gary. <laughs> if, it, if it was a, a, a flying saucer with that kind of technology, you would think there would be more damage to the um, trees and stuff. There would be more signs of engine um, or a higher Geiger counter or there would be something more than they got. Well, there was quite high readings out there, apparently. Um you know, I don't know what more to say about that because I mean, what else to say? I wasn't there, but I understand there was high, quite high radiation readings, even a couple of days later. Hmm. Well, on one account, I and also read... you don't know what sort of um, it, it might apparently uh, in the report of uh, Holt made it, it seemed like there was dripping metal coming from the. the, the um, apparently, didn't somebody? I think they've got a. a um, 
like a dripping, like yeah, like running solder type metal, which was found. Well, I've come, I say, and I don't know as much as you guys do, so I'm just throwing what I, you know, things out there. I found that. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to point. In, I'm going to come in there. I'm okay. not even. I'm not even a big expert. I mean, I, I've, I've got. But the man you really want to get on here, who's a real expert, is Ronnie Dugdale. I okay. mean, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie's the man who started uh, putting me right with the Warren story, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I mean, when, when I was a, 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 a loyal Warren supporter, um, it was he that was started putting me right, saying, you know, do, do some more studying and do some more research into what's going on with his letter and the, mm-hmm. and the book and everything else and the dates and start looking at that. Yeah. And, and I, took, I took that on board and it was only... After the, the the Glasgow fiasco, and then the other fiasco with the barbecue at Eastgate, which mm-hmm. touched on yet. Um, no, 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 we'll get there. Don't which I start, which I started thinking. Yeah, I mean, it was Ronnie. It, Ronnie's the man you really need. He's the real mm. expert. Okay, well, there's again conflicting reports on mm. the radiation readings that they got. Um, Nick Pope, who you know very well, reasonably um, well. Yeah. <laughs> we do, we do, we do talk quite a bit. Yeah. We um, have drinks okay. together, David. Come on. <laughs> Come on, you know him quite well. You know him better than us. He won't, he won't be listening to this. I'll tell you a funny little story. Was, <laughs> I, was having, I was actually out having a drink with, uh, with, with Nick Pope and Eric Von Daniken, and it was Mike Barra also. I don't know if you've heard the name. Mm-hmm. But um, I think Nick had one or two vodka and tonics too many. He was a bit rather, it was quite funny, actually. That was about half past 12 at night. I, I ended up going back to my room about quarter to one, I think it was. But so I think Eric Von Daniken packed up about midnight. Yeah, quite, quite a funny evening, actually. Quite, quite surreal, as you can imagine, like uh, ancient aliens evening. <laughs> oh, I bet it was. <laughs> anyway, sorry, sorry to digress, but that was uh, it. Was quite a funny. <laughs> well, Nick has described the radiation readings yeah. taken by Colonel Holt's team, um, which were taken at the alleged UFO landing site. Okay, oh. as the most tangible proof that something extraordinary happens there. But then we find a conflicting report um, when you look at the UK National Radiolog- well, I can't even say this word, Radiological Protection Board that the levels of radiation were simply background levels of radiation. So again, a conflicting reports. Yeah. I'm no yeah, yes. expert in this, so I'm, I'm just chucking out I'm the naive. ideas. So, um, so again, all along, every single step of the way, you're getting conflicting reports on dates, times, experiences, what happened, radiation readings, um, meteorological conditions, all sorts of conflicting reports at every yeah. single step, aren't we, with this? Yeah, and I would say that maybe that's what the Air Force wanted. Wow, maybe that's they, a conspiracy maybe, theory maybe, for maybe you. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they wanted that confusion to, to cover up whatever it was. I mean, be it a military exercise, be it a UFO. Mm-hmm. They didn't want the, the actual truth coming out. I mean, I, I go with the UFO theory myself, personally. But, I mean, I could be wrong. I, I, but um, but um, one way or the other, they were trying to keep it. They were, there was no doubt about it. They were trying to keep it quiet and, and confuse everything. This is it. This is what I was just about to say. It's basically confusement, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It definitely sounds it when you start trying to break it down. And, and it doesn't help that you have stories coming out of events that happened, like Left at East Gate, that seem to embellish the story quite an awful lot. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know... <laughs> Let's put it like this. I read it twice, believing every word of it. And I, I read it a third time afterwards, thinking, "What? Are they, what? Are they? I can actually see through right through it now, on the third reading of it." Mm. When I've got, I've got two copies. I've got a hard copy, a hardback copy, and also a softback copy. The later release. I so, use my soft, I use my softback copy to make all markings and things, and you know, to find the, when we were doing the like, investigation and checkups and things. I was going to say to you, so when you read that book, was it at that point that you went, okay, let's look deeper at this. Let, let's start breaking it down and seeing if we can get verifiable facts and documented proof of what was said. Was that your first interest point of Rendlesham? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a bit of a difficult question. I, I mean, I, let me just do a little bit of background, right? <laughs> I, I actually moved to this area in 2015. 
Mm. Right. Oh no, sorry, Pinky Boyle. It was 2013. Before that, I was just like everybody else. I'd read about the Rendlesham um, Forest incident and everything, and I was just sort of, I, was, I knew a few of the names like John Barrows and Peniston, and I heard mm-hmm. the name of this and Larry Warren and everything else. I'd read the book a couple of times. And then suddenly I, I, I moved to this area and I, was, I found out, I, I'd actually realised I was actually living not too far from Rendlesham Forest, mm-hmm. you know. So I started taking a deeper interest in it. Um, and the first time I really started getting it more in, much, absolutely more interested in it, it was when I went to a Woodbridge conference and Larry Warren, Gary Heseltine, um, Richard Dolan and John Burroughs were given a presentation there. Or separate presentations, um, and that's kind of when I started getting more interested in it, you know, in the actual characters and deeper into the story. Mm-hmm. And that's when I start, That's when I started realizing this is this, this is a lot more confusing than just reading. Oh, there was a UFO in, in 1980. That you know, it, it, there's a lot more to it with the characters and everything involved. Um, so that's kind of a bit more. I've, I've lost where we were starting from now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Oh, you're a bit interested. like Rendlesham Forest. Yeah, a bit like Rendlesham Forest, because you can go round and round, and there are so many conflicting reports, aren't there? Yeah. That's, what, that's kind of what I was trying to explain, how I got more interested in, in it, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And then, it was the week, then the year after that, in 2000 and... Uh, no, it was 15. Well, 2015. That's right, yeah, it was 2014, I went to that um, conference with the... With a, with a, with a, with a, <coughs> 2015... Was the Holt was the famous Holt at Woodbridge conference, which is the first time I ever I thought oh, this man I've, I've sort of heard about him all these years, and I wanted to go and see him. And there's John Hansen uh, was putting on this the Haunted Skies um, conference. Mm-hmm. And there's as I don't know if you all know, but it ended up being quite a controversial conference where. Um, Holt was saying about Warren wasn't there and everything else, and there was a lot of hoo ha about it, kicked up about it. Few complaints about people coming, you know, traveling sort of a certain distance and everything else. But uh, I mean, to me, it was fine because I only sort of lived down the road, so it wasn't too much of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I see it. Oh, like it was just be my entrance fee, and that was it. I was on top of it. Yeah. But, but that's when I first actually met Colonel Holt, and um, even me, even at that point in time, I thought it was quite unfair what he was saying. It wasn't until after that I started to realise that, you know, when, when, when the, the, the later the Glasgow thing happened, I thought, well, there's a lot more in this, what Colonel Holt was saying, than actually um, the, the Larry Warren version, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah. And that's kind of where I, and I, I started, I was actually, somehow I, I got, Started talking to Brenda Butler and John Hanson. We, we became sort of quite friendly because I, I'm quite. I live near Brenda. She's only sort of like 15 minutes away. And John Hanson uh, runs the Haunted Skies books, and uh, we sort of become really good friends now. Um, we had quite a few conversations on the phone talking about this conference, the um, conference, and um, I tried to, I tried to put over to John, and I can see why people were kind of upset and. Trying to look at it from sort of both angles, you know. Yeah. And from my own point of view, I was still pleased I met the man, and uh, I'm even more pleased now that um, I'm in sort of a lot of con- constant contact with him, you know, mm-hmm. as well as John. And we've become kind of friends. I mean, he's been to my home and everything. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this, but I'm just trying to explain that how I got more interested in, in it, you know. Yeah. I got deeper into finding out more about the characters of, of the incident. Um, so uh, you're starting at this point in your journey of this to realise that there's a lot more to it and there's a lot more disinformation out there than you initially thought. Yeah. Well, when I call it disinformation or confused information, I don't know. I, I think there's, there's a certain amount of both, to be honest. I think there's a lot of confusion as to what actually happen from different people but there's probably some disinformation as well from probably from um, the Air Force side of things or the military side because I think they like the fact that it's, that it's all confused 
like I said before, I think they, they like the fact that there's no straight answers to it. Yeah. I, uh, no, that's, that would not surprise it's a, it's me. A, it's kind of the same with Roswell, isn't it? There's no straight answers to that either. No. I was going to say, yeah. it's, it's sounding very Roswellian, isn't it? Because you mm. try looking into that, there's a lot of disinformation, a lot of, like, the dates are all a bit skew with, timings As, are not... Well, I mean, really, that, that happens with just about every UFO report there is. The, the, more, the more serious they seem to be taken, the more confusing they seem to get, you know, with uh, conflicting reports. <coughs> Gary? Oh, I just, I'm it, just sitting oh. here... Um, Basically, minding my own business, listening. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> David sort of explained how he got involved in the Rendlesham Forest incident. Um, I mean, I've spoke to David at length. Mm. Um, obviously, oh, well, it's not that. just. Let, let, let it's just jump not, in that. Yeah, I mean, just jump in there. I'm not really involved in the Rendlesham Forest incident because I don't want to insert myself into the whole incident. <laughs> just... No, yeah, yeah, no, no we're I'm, not I'm just looking at it. Looking at it. Looking at it. And, yeah. um, I know, obviously, bits and pieces because we've been chinwagging. And at one point, the reason you actually got more in-depth into it, shall we say, is that a better yeah. way of putting it? Yeah. Was was that you had a personal attack against you by a certain person? A would couple, you, yeah, yeah, a you, couple. You know, I'm not asking you to elaborate, but this is you, you didn't actually mention it, so I just thought I would throw that one out. That you know, you, you were sort of you wanted to know about it, but you was more forced into it because of personal attacks on. Yeah, well, yeah. I, mean, I can explain a little bit about it if anyone's interested. Um, I mentioned about the Glasgow conference and the fact that Larry Warren was barred when Peter Robbins came over to give his presentation. I think I think um, Warren actually turned up anyway, even knowing knowing that he was barred. And I was outside talking to him and saying how badly it had been treated and everything. And then we was invited for a drink in the evening. And I went up with Peter and a couple of others and um, and and Warren and. Uh, Anyway, it was then that we were still saying how badly it had been treated and everything, and it was only like the, the few, a day or two afterwards that we started seeing the truth coming out from Alison Dunlop about the issue of showing the letters about what, how, why he had been barred and everything. Well, and I, I started to realise, well, well, that's not what we were told, and that's not the truth. Of, you know, we, we, I wasn't told the truth, basically. And, um, and then a few, I would say probably a, a couple of months after that, I, I thought I'd, I would give you... A, a, a wide birth there and just keep my eye on him and, well not keep my eye on him just keep keep an eye on what's being said and things back and forth because there was quite a lot of arguments between uh, Sasha and, and Larry going on and yeah. which you try to stay out of because you, you're not really involved in it no and it's like and, that, and is then, the, that is a major part of the controversy, controversy that surrounds yeah. this is the the massive um Wrangle, I'm going to use that yeah. word, that yeah. goes backwards and forwards to this day um, between mm. the two camps. There's two camps, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. Um, kind of, I, yeah. You know, it's, so it seems. I hate to look at it like that, but yeah, that's the way it seems, yeah, it to, to outsiders. Yeah. From an outsider's perspective, that's yeah. how it looks. And I'm not going to pass judgment or say well, one side's right, one side's wrong. Because when we looked at the bare case... It's like, it's like the Hatfields and McCoy, isn't it? It, it is, <laughs> a little. But it is also... When you when you break it down, even take those two factors out of it. When you start looking at the case, there is so much disinformation. You yeah. you add a wrangle in the middle of that. You don't know whether you're coming or going with it. Yeah, yeah. I, there's been quite plenty of times I didn't know I was coming or going with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when, and it must be very difficult. Just <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just finish off what I was saying about the yeah. the, the, the the reason that I, I ended up kind of involved in it. I was actually having conversations with Sasha, disagreeing with her and things. I, I was, I, I was believing what Warren was saying about Sasha that that she was poisoned and everything else, and, and a lot of people were, were believing it. And anyway, besides, what, what what actually happened is a friend of mine or ours, Derek, of mine, we used to come walking in the woods with us quite a lot. Chris, um, he actually had a, an accident on the way home one night and died. He hit a tree. Oh. 
and um, his favourite place in the woods was to go up to Eastgate, and he'd have barbecues occasionally, you know. So we thought a, a fitting tribute would be to have a barbecue up at Eastgate for him uh-huh. one, one afternoon. And what happened after? The, well, we started getting insults from Warren saying we were, in, we were disrespecting his brothers and God knows what else. And it was like, it's all American and everything. And the, what, you know, what, what, do you, what the hell do you think we think we're doing? And I was saying to him, I said, well, this has nothing to do with you at all, Larry. I mean, this, this, this was actually his favourite place to go. And it kind of kicked off from there, really. It became a, more of a personal subject mm. that, uh, that brought me into it. And I started talking to Sasha um, more seriously about things. And, and she was showing me a lot more um, evidence and stuff. And, I was, and a lot of it all just started making sense, you know, that uh, I could actually see the poison it wasn't coming from Sasha. It was coming from Warren. You know? and, um, and it's kind of the way it's gone since. <laughs> And then I started getting, I mean, we've all had death threats. I mean, there was only a little while, a little while ago, he was saying about, uh, oh, he's going to free my wife from, from, from me or something. And anyway, there's been some police reports about it uh, along the line as well. So, but I won't go too, too much into that. No, I don't really want to get no. into the arguments no. that's gone backwards and forwards because that's no. none of our business. Our business is, did something happen in Rendlesham yeah. on that night? Um, it is very, very strange. Now, that whole area, take out this case, mm. that whole area of Rendlesham Forest has been long associated with strange phenomena in yes. the local people have you know talked about strange occurrences that go on in that forest regardless of this ufology situation haven't they yeah and ufo reports before that as well really yeah i think there was one um i think was it was it about 76 i think there was a big report i don't have to get the details but i do understand there's there's been one or two more um things besides the uh, the 1980 rfi I think there was something since as well. But it's been renowned for paranormal activity in that forest as well, hasn't it, Gary? Yeah. We were talking a little before, weren't we, before the show about Um, some of the stranger things that have happened in that forest, or allegedly happened in that forest. uh, Allegedly. (laughs) Allegedly. (laughs) Allegedly. Hopefully we'll find out when I go this year. But... um, (laughs) I mean, obviously, he's talking to other people and talking to David. Um, it's supposed to be, supposedly, uh, a, a grey lady um, figure. There's David. David said earlier um, before show. Uh, there's monks been seen, um, dwarf-like figures, mm, a, a, a giant supposedly. But I mean, it all sounds so ridiculous. But the people, the thing is, you see. The people that have told me these stories, they're, they're, they're actually um, believable. They're not the sort of people that would make these sort of things up. You know, mm. that, that's kind of, well, once you know them, that is. I suppose if someone listening out there on, in radio they can, is hearing this and think, oh, what love old rubbish. But actually, when you know these people and the people that are telling you that, you know you can trust what they're telling you. You know, it's, um, it's weird. That, that's the thing, isn't it? And this is this all comes down to um, personal experience and the trust in the person that's telling the story to you. If uh, mm. you meet a random stranger who tells you the story, you kind of think uh, bonkers, um, a little bit maybe. Or but when you know the person and they're going, I know it sounds crazy, but that happened. That's the experience I had. That's mm. what happened to me. I ended up with you know scratches, or I ran out of the forest. I was terrified. And you can see when they're talking that they're reliving that experience and they're having that emotional response to it again, you know, and you know that person, it makes it more credible for you as a person, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the, the story's half of it. I, I, there's no way that I would disbelieve the person because uh, they just not the, that sort of person to make that type of story up, in my, mm. in my opinion, anyway. And I've heard them tell the story a few times to other people, and it doesn't change. It's the same story. You know, often when someone is making things up, they, it, it changes or gets enhanced or they forget something or, you know, you've got to have a good memory to be a good liar. That's true. That is very, very true. I will definitely agree with that point. So what 
to where I, I have to say, because of there's so much disinformation, and I found a lot of... Um, now, bearing in mind, I haven't deeply researched this. I've, I've looked around the internet, and, and that's mm. sort of where I came across various um, explanations to things that they, they happened. But I also go back to, these aren't just normal people. These are military people. Yeah. That well, have had these. They were, they were actually military police uh, people, security people as well. So they weren't, um, they weren't basically pilots and things. Anyway, they were, they were like a police uh, corps. Right. So Colonel Lieutenant Holt did not have any flying experience. I, I, I don't think so. I don't. I think I'm not sure if he was a. I, I know he, it's, he served a lot of. Um, <coughs> Uh, I, I, you'd have to get the book, the, the whole um, perspective to find out. I don't think he was a pilot, no. He's actually spent a lot of years um, in Vietnam and whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, it, in his later years, he went to uh, the Pentagon. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of jobs that are in the Air Force. He don't actually fly. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's very true, too. Um, but you think they'd have some knowledge of that kind of thing if they're in the air force? Um, well, they obviously, obviously had the A10s there, so obviously they must have had pilots there. Yeah, mm. but these were these were the but the the people that saw the UFO were the police contingent of of the yeah you know, the the lawmakers, if you like. Yeah. Okay. It's as I say, it's full of. You could pick it apart. We could sit here all night picking every single little detail apart on this mm. particular story, couldn't we? And every single point you can bring up, you'll find somebody that's found it or think they found and backed up with a logical explanation, but then another which disputes that too. So it is one of those stories, isn't it, that who knows exactly what happened unless we had um, exact, I don't know, recordings and stuff. I mean, the only recording we've got is the transcript from the the second night where they were chasing the lights through the forest and doing the Geiger counter and stuff like that. We've got transcripts of that. Um, But because there's so much, like the dates were wrong, I I find that quite unbelievable that a lieutenant colonel submitted a report two weeks um, after the event. Um, You would think it would have been done on the night due to the import of military and um just military you would think mm. it would be done and later on in life he rewrote it and embellished a lot as well didn't he um well i don't know about embellished it <laughs> i don't know where you got that from but i don't think he's embellished the story at all i think he's i think his story's not really changed that much mm. I, really I think he might have actually told a bit more than, than maybe back then, because if once he's retired, he's, and also he's coming out with some more a bit later this year. When we go to, he's coming over in, to Hull, in the, and apparently there's a new witness. Ah, a new witness. We may find out a bit more. How credible then do you think, um, because there's so much has been written on this, um, mm. so many books, so many... Um, documentaries have been done on this and the bare bones of this is there was at least on two evenings um, there were experiences on two evenings I mean we'll go with the three evening theory because I think that's kind of of the the, the general thing I think the the thing is what what were the dates that's that's where it all gets thrown into confusion yeah I mean yeah I mean, you, Colonel Holt has actually spent time at your house, David, hasn't he? He has, yeah. Right. You've spoken to him at length about Rendlesham Forest in pretty your much. house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty In much. your house, one on one. Yeah. Now, I'd, I've spoken to you at length on my investigations. I spoke to you at Paraforce at length, and I felt I've. Personally, think you're an upstanding guy, mm. credible. I try to be. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I try to be. Yeah, yeah. And if, if I was to, if you was on one of my investigations and you come up to me and said, "I've just heard this," I would put you down as a, a, a proper witness. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, you're actually got Colonel Holt in your house, one on one, and you are looking at looking at him in the eyes. Mm -hmm. Can you actually turn around and say that he is an authoritative witness in your yes. own, in your opinion? Yes. Yes, but because even he says still now he doesn't know what he saw. He doesn't know what it was. All he knows is they, they saw lights and, and they were fully, uh, they were chasing lights. So what else can you call it but a UFO? You know, it's kind of... It, 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 I just don't know what else you can call it. You know, unless it was some sort of strange aircraft that the Russians have got or something and they were infiltrating their airspace or the, and also the American airspace. Which is what it was at yeah, Unfortunately, if there's strange lights or anything, as it is, as as what we say, we go straight away UFO. The UFO is unidentified flying object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we, we get to the UFO point a bit, but uh, the the, um, the 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 spacecraft type for, from the first night's uh, viewing of from, from Peniston and Burrow. Mm -hmm. So. Now, I suppose you could ask the question, was it actually the same thing again the nights after? <laughs> you know, that's kind of another question, isn't it? Or was it yeah. something completely different? Yeah, it's just coincidence that it seems to happen like two, <laughs> con you know, the, the two same in sequence. Mm. You know, it, it's fascinating and it is a fascinating place to visit. Um, if you haven't been to Rendlesham, I'll give it a go. Definitely, if it interested me um, when I went, and I didn't know the story inside out like um, you guys um, do. You know more than I do. I don't. I don't think any of us know it inside out. Maybe I'll tell you, the best bloke who does know it inside out, basically, is, but as far as you can know it, is Ronnie Dugdale. Get him mm. on your program one day, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he will probably put me right on a few things. <laughs> But it is a fascinating topic and it is one of the best known ufology cases in the UK. Um, off the yeah. back of Rendlesham, um, the incident at Rendlesham, was there a spat of other cases in short succession after Rendlesham? So did it lead into sort of like a bit of hysteria um, when it hit the media? Uh, well, you're asking me that. Um... Yeah. I don't know. I think there's a, there's a constant. Um, the, the, you get UFO sightings every day, basically. I mean, you'd be surprised how many sightings there are every day, all over the country. In fact, all over the world. So, whether you call it a spat or not, I don't know. I, I suppose there are some times when it's it is busier. But um, if you if you if you, I mean, you know, a good example of seeing what sort of sights uh, sightings there are all over Anglia and the rest of the UK mm -hmm. is the Haunted Skies books that John does. John yeah. Hudson, um, you, you'd be amazed at the, the amount of reports there are because he, he's very, very um, meticulous in, in dating them and placing them and describing where they're, they're, they're quite amazing actually and you'd be fascinated by the amount of sightings there are. Do you it's think really that a lot of the um, UFO sightings that are seen can be explained by normal um, logical reasons? Yeah, a certain amount will be. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 but I, th I think John tries to stick to the actual unaccount un unexplainable ones yeah. rather than the ones you can explain. I mean, they're obviously going to be balloons and Chinese lanterns and God knows what else, you know, that, that are fine. Especially nowadays when you've got your um, drones and God knows, you know. I was going to say, about. there's so much more now, isn't there? Yeah, yeah there's, there's the so sky. many things that can be, it can be now. But, um, but they're also... Other things that that sort of appear and then disappear and without explanation, and they get seen on radar and uh, as well, or things get seen and they're not on radar. It's uh, the reverse of uh, the, the thing that fascinates me is how they can appear and then disappear. I mean, I've seen yeah. them do it myself. And we were up at Eastgate one night, and Brenda was with me, and this is when Chris was still around. We were watching a star move and then stop and then move, and then stop. And all of a sudden, another one started doing the same thing, starting moving and stopping. And, I mean, how do you account for that? Is that, uh, I mean, is that some sort of an aircraft? The only thing I can put it down. I mean, it looks like a star moving and then stopping. You know? Well, I don't know how you can explain that. And, you know, with no sound, you know, they're, they're completely silent. 
It is a fascinating topic, I have to say. Um, the whole ufology situation, I mean, I've never had that kind of experience myself. Have you, Gary? I've had strange lights, but um, I used to do a lot of night fishing years and years ago. Um, and you sort of get used to what stars are, as David said, you get used to what stars are where in the night sky. Mm-hmm. And I was actually seeing there, and I was actually tracing two lights, and they were fading in and out, going up and down. Um, at the time, I sort of dismissed it uh, because Stansted Airport was about 20 miles up the road from where I was fishing, so I basically dismissed it as an aircraft. Mm. But did I see one on the night? I could have done. I don't know. Yeah, well, this is it. You don't know, do you? No. no. But, but all, you, all you have to ask yourself is, what could it have been? This is it. You know, this is why. When you, when you can't come up with an answer to that, you, then you start asking yourself, well, did I see a UFO? You know? Mm. I mean, I, I mean, I'll go back to now. When I was a kid living in London, I'm going back to around about 1958, 59. I was sitting on my steps. Now, this is, <coughs> now, this is way before the, the, the real, even the, the satellites started going up. Shows you how far back it was. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can actually remember then seeing a star moving and stopping and moving and stopping. And I, I, and as a kid, I didn't. I think, oh, it's a star moving. It's only later on when I realised that stars don't do that. You know, when I grew up a bit, and I sort of started learning about the, oh. the stars, and and so what the hell was that back in around about the late fifties? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's a fascinating <laughs> topic. Anyway, my beautiful men, we've come to the end of the show pretty much. We've overrun quite a bit. <laughs> oh dear. I do apologise. Um, no, fine. Fascinating. It's my long stories. It? <laughs> no, it's been great. Um, well, that hopefully shows you how difficult it is to pin down this kind of investig or incident. Actually, this is how hard it can be when you when you are dealing with this kind of incident, the misinformation or the incorrect information mm-hmm. um, that's handed out along these and it's breaking it down and trying to find um the information that takes it to fact and it's incredible yeah. one thing's for sure it makes it incredibly difficult doesn't it yeah and i'm sure nobody out anyone listening out there is none the wiser <laughs> no not really because i say for every argument we have for one way we found a counter argument for another way and it, it <laughs> it's like you say there's so many inconsistencies and misdirections and and you know you ask it just it's a bit like the paranormal ufology but it's totally like the paranormal one way Mm. of thinking leads to a million other questions yeah it does and did anybody else eh? say if anybody else has listened to this radio show hopefully they have yeah there's loads of people in the chat room they've now come to yet another brick wall in the Rendlesham forest (laughs) yeah that's right well this is the issue at least we've had an interesting conversation between the three of us, if nobody else is listening anyway. No, no, there are people listening, and I've <laughs> um, put the questions they've asked in, even though I haven't named them. Let me just give a few shout-outs while we're here. Kaz is there, Henry is there, um, Mark D is in there, um, Bear is in there. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in the chat room. I have been trying to bring your points up um, throughout I mean, the conversation. Honest, I mean- if anyone wants to, I mean, speak to me about anything, I mean, you've only got to go to my Facebook page, David Young, and uh, I've, I've got a couple of sites I run. I've got the RFI, um, Rendlesham, uh, I forgot what it's called it now. <laughs> <What's the perspective>? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, RFI, it's the Rendlesham True Perspective page, and also I run the uh, SPI Anglia Region page. Uh, if anyone wants to come and join and ask me anything, or if I try and answer it, or... If they're interested in, I'm going to try and arrange some um, meetings and things. I think Gary's going to try and help me out with that as well. Mm-hmm. Now he's now he's got over his his, his uh, shock from a few yeah. a couple of months ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll get to get some uh, meetings up in the Angler region on the, S- the SPI. So yeah, 
cool. which will be going out um, at local halls and places at a reasonable price. So hopefully get get to see some of you out there. Yeah, yeah definitely. We're that not going to try and start arranging some get-togethers and things. That would be fascinating. One thing's for sure, when I visited Rendlesham Forest, it wasn't a quiet forest in the night in that area. There was um, plenty of people out and about in that forest, so just be aware of that if you do go into the woods. Um, yeah, bikes night. flying about. <laughs> yeah, there's, there was a team out there and we could see lights. That was, I'll tell you a quick funny story. When we were there, there was lights going on um, in the, and it was like, you know, the story of lights going through the woods and you're seeing this light and you're thinking, mm. ooh, that's interesting. And it's actually a torch by a paranormal team that were actually in the forest that <laughs> <Yeah>. night. <laughs> yeah, you, you can get some scares if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So there was people around there. But it is a fascinating area. It's a fascinating, um, I'll call it a story, but, you know, account, shall we say. Um, and thank you so, so much for coming on and talking to us about it tonight. And thank you, Gary, for being such a lovely co-host. You're welcome, and hopefully do it again sometime. I'm sure we will. Um, thank you, David, for joining us. Okay, thank you for inviting me, and it's been uh, fun. <laughs> no. I hope it's been interesting, even if it's been confusing to most people. <laughs> well, I found it very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, everybody, to me anyway. don't forget, tomorrow night um, on Parasearch Radio, we kick off at 8pm with the Supernatural Chat Show, followed by 9pm Haunted Histories. If you like what you've heard tonight, don't forget, we are on YouTube. Click, like, share and subscribe over Parasearch Radio. Go search it out. And on that note, we bid you a very farewell and good night. Thank you for good listening. Night. Good night. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.